This is about crafting um, usable, reliable surveys so that you can get reliable information from these human subjects. So I'm talking about questionnaires, okay? So the golden standard for designing questionnaires is called the mixed mode approach, where you actually um, ha use more than, you don't just do a phone survey or a mail survey or a in-person survey, you actually use multiple, if not all of these modes um, to, to conduct your survey. So I usually, you know, use a combo of mail or face-to-face -face or something like that. Um, but that's not always possible. I'm just putting that at the first slide. That's um, a lot of these, a lot of the things I'm putting in this presentation are um, aspirational. So again, the golden standard. What what would um, you really um, a, aspire to do if you were to do a survey without money and time limitations? Um, just putting that out there. The the big questions in surveys is um, the que is <laughs> the questions themselves. Should they be open ended or close ended? So an example of an open-ended would be, how satisfied are you with the food you have been provided at tea breaks? Um, and a close-ended version, and so P there would be a response box and you would write, you know, oh, I thought the, the muffins were delicious, but I didn't like this. Or, um, you know, um, it would have been great if the food was warm, it was warm, but you know, but people would, would write in what they wanted. A close-ended um, survey, there's no opportunity to, a close-ended question, there's no opportunity to write anything. What you're doing is you're checking a choice or circling a choice. Um, so here, the food provided at tea breaks was satisfactory. Do I definitely agree? Agree? Am I neutral? Do I disagree or definitely disagree? So notice that this um, way of organizing the answers, this is called a five-point because it has five different choice answers, Likert scale. It's one, it's um, important to organize things that way. There should always be a neutral choice and there should, and there should always be a balance. So you wouldn't put, you know, two definite, two things that were positive, one neutral and one negative because people tend to choice, to pick something that's in the middle. So you have to pick a, an answer set potential answer set that are balanced and that have a, a middle category um, when you use closed-ended uh, questions. Usually in a questionnaire you're um, you will use closed-ended questions if it's something that's self-administered, i.e., you know, you send something or it's on the internet and people click. They're doing it on their own. So through the mail or through the phone, you're asking them, you know, to pick number one, number two, number three. Um, it's oftentimes used when you're trying to measure, i.e., quantify some knowledge or attitudes or behaviors. Um, but if if you don't know what your question should be or if you don't have a good sense of what the answers might be, then you should use an open-ended um, survey. So when you're doing exploratory research, I'll use more open-ended questions. And when I'm, use, I'm doing something that I've done many times, I'll use a closed-ended question because I already have a good sense of what the answers might be. My questions have been pretty well vetted um, and it's, you can get much more data and analyze it much more quickly. Um, so the closed-ended questions, they're really easy to code, um, um, you know, to, to have those, those choices because you want to use the Likert scale method. Um, they're really easy to enter the data and it makes it a lot easier to have those values and you can just calculate the mean of people's answers. Um, they're easy to present because of that as well, right? You can do pie charts or, or histograms uh, well, of, of you know, how many people picked the different choices. Um, they're typically, they're, no, they're very much um, faster turnaround. So as I'm getting survey answers, I can already do my plots, etc. in R. They afford people a degree of anon anonymity. 
So, um, so people oftentimes have less of a problem answering personal questions if it's a closed-ended question because they're just picking a box rather than telling you their life story. So they're more willing to answer questions that may be a little bit sensitive if it's a closed-ended question. Um, there's also less bias in interpretation of the answers. Um, and, um, well, I already said the last one. The disadvantages of the closed-ended questions, and thus the advantages of open-ended questions, is that sometimes those response categories um, for the questions don't necessarily make, uh, they, they, there's just not a good fit for, you know, you can't always ask a question where it's going to be strongly agree to strongly disagree. Um, and so that might be a time where you pick an open-ended question. Um, and, and you can think, oh, well, I can always reframe a question so that, um, you know, reword a question so that I have those five choices as a possibility. But you'll be amazed at how sometimes then your question has a different meaning. It's not exactly what you wanted to ask. So if there's no way to frame that question to ask it exactly the way you wanted and have a five point Likert scale answer, then you probably want to just do the open-ended um, question format. Um, if you make your questions, your cl close-ended questions mandatory to answer, especially in a web survey or a phone survey, you are go and you haven't worded it right, you are going to force someone to answer, i.e. pick something that they didn't want, or there's something you didn't consider that just doesn't apply to them, but you're making them choose uh, an answer and it'll skew your data. Um, it'll, if, if you have questions that are sensitive, sometimes people really want to tell you um, more about it and you're not allowing them to do that. So this is a question I got on a survey that Miami sends us every year to assess our um, health. And the question was, during the past month, have you felt depressed? And these were the answers. And it's like, okay, well, maybe I have felt depressed, but you know, my dog died or my grandma died. And that's why I'm not depressed because my work makes me miserable most of the time. Um, no, but <laughs> I can't believe that's recorded. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Or because my maybe we can, idiot, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe we can edit that part out um, but but if you're asking that type of questions you probably want to put a box below do you have anything to add because people and really you know it'll matter because it's not exactly what you're looking for anyways um, so so yeah the wording of the questions matter greatly so if you're surveying adults they say that eighth grade vocabulary are the maximum uh, upper level vocabulary that you can use. Um, so otherwise you're just gonna have, you know, uh, you might have nonsense answers. Obviously you have to pick word choices and um, you, you have to pick words that people understand that are, you know, you would never in a survey put ecosystem services. The general public does not know what those are. You would have to spell out, you know, benefits we derive from nature, for example, and you would have to do it on every single page of that survey. Or you would just guarantee you would get weird results. Um, you want to avoid double negatives. So that, that what that might mean is you might ask, um, you know, um, the, the, the food at the tea breaks was not satisfactory. And then you're asking people to strongly agree or disagree. And like they can't, like half the people can't flip that question. And so they're gonna answer strongly agree when they meant strongly disagree because there's a negative in the question and, and it just confuses them. So make sure you, you write things as positive statements and then ask them to disagree or, or agree. Um, it's just better. Uh, Double-barreled questions are where you ask two questions in one sentence. So I really like, so you know, I was really satisfied with the food at the tea breaks and the food at the lunch room. Well, what if I was satisfied with one but not the other? I, that's a double-barreled question. It's got to be split into two questions. That happens all the time. Um, 
Over and under specification is when you're asking people way too many details. I once received a survey about nutrition that asked me for the grams of different fruits and vegetables that I ate in a week. Like, yeah, right. Like, how am I ever supposed to know that? It's just not something, I'm not going to go around with the scale and like weigh my vegetables. Like, nobody has time for that. And so you really have to think in ways that people um, perceive the information or you're going to get garbage. Um, and then this is a big one in the U.S. in particular. Americans love acronyms and they stick them everywhere. And I know when I first moved there, they're like there's even acronyms on our uh, road signs. And it's like, I don't know what that is. Um, it's the same thing in a survey, right? If you're using land use, land cover, LULC, or even something NASA, don't assume that everybody knows what that is. You have any kind of acronym or, or even jargon you have to define um, in order to um, in order to have responses you um, you can trust. Uh, this is just an example. Um, this was actually on the ballot um, in Colorado, um, and it, so this is the question verbatim. Shall there be an amendment to the Colorado Constitution concerning the removal of the exception to the prohibition of slavery and involuntary servitude when used as a punishment for persons duly convicted of a crime? It's a triple negative. <laughs> it's, so, in the polls leading up to the election, like 95% of people are like, of course we should, um, we should remove this, um, this, this law from the books. What do you think the results were? Nobody understood the question, so it went 50-50. Like so, yeah, so it was, well, well anyways, so, um, so basically, they have to redo the... Something. Yeah, the problem is not only to understand the question. The sentence is too long. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, it has all sorts of problems. And it's using words... A specific thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, one rule, and you've got to keep questions simple. And obviously, you know, they failed on so many levels. But, but it's a true example. This is like just a couple years ago. Um, okay. So the general guidelines for, um, for creating a survey is ahead of time, you really need to think, why am I surveying these people? What are the goals of my survey? What am I trying to find out? Because, and why is this so important? As you start writing your questions, you're like, ooh, this would be interesting to know. Ooh, this would be interesting to know. And you start adding questions, and they don't really relate to your, to your um, goals. And then your survey is just insanely long and convoluted, and you might not even answer your question. So um, be very clear at the beginning, you know, I want to do a survey of, of people to value the ecosystem service of X. And then you will only come up with questions that relate to that. And every time you write a new question, you will ask yourself, does this help me answer, you know, achieve my goals and objectives or not? Um, you, the one big thing, is to look in the literature for available surveys. In my lab, we do that all the time. If someone's crafted a survey, used it, published those results, and even if they didn't publish the survey instrument themselves, the questions, you can email the, um, the researchers and ask for those questions, you know? And so typically, like our surveys, they're a mishmash of like three different other people's surveys. And yeah, we'll have our own questions, but at least we have questions that have essentially been vetted before. And it like really saves up on time. Plus it allows for a neat comparison. What did I find compared to theirs? So that's cool on top of it. Um, so, so really go back to the literature and see how have other people ask the types of questions you want. Um, and it really saves you a ton of time so just as a hint, building on what Emily said, that sometimes the questionnaire is not in the, in the paper, but you can find it in the supplementary information. 
So you can also look for the appendix and see more and more commonly people are attaching their surveys in the appendix. So people can see which questions the, the authors actually ask on the field and you can use the same so you can compare. So always also look for the supplementary as well. And again, if they don't have it there in the paper or in the supplementary info, contact the researcher and say and tell them like I will give you attribution. Obviously, you know, you'll say in your in your methods these questions were derived from these people and those people and those people. Um, but at the, but you're not starting from scratch, which which is big. You really need to think about what your population is. Who am I asking these questions? Who's the selected, uh, the, the pool of people that might be selected to take this survey and why? And that's going to be related to your goals and objectives. If you're, you know, trying to get at the valuation of trees in a city, then it's easy. It's every single inhabitant of the city, right? Um, but sometimes it's not as clear cut. Um, you also want to think about, again, uh, we already talked about this, but you know, are, am I going to do open-ended or closed-ended? Am I going to do five-point Likert scale? Well, I was showing you five different choices. Or a seven-point Likert scale. There's some that have more choices in there. Um, usually I use five, but um, just for ease of comprehensive. You have to be wary of the length. So the longer the survey, the more likely people are not going to finish it. And the rule of thumb is that you shouldn't ask more than three dozen questions total. And this is for closed-ended questions. Um, Open-ended, it's even fewer than that, maybe at max 10, 12. Um, so uh, there's a term called survey fatigue. If people just you know, people have a limited amount of bandwidth, and if you reach it, they'll just stop. And then you'll have what's called non-response bias. Um, you, uh, the one way to write the questions is to start with a statement and then flip it into a question. It's much more easy than just being, trying to craft a question. Um, and then I already said this one. If you're using specialized terms, you need a box at the top that defines them on every single page. Um, the survey is, mu all we've been talking about essentially are the questions, but the survey in order to get high response rates, and high response rates means more likely to get published. So in order to get that high response rate, you need to think about more than just the questions. Um, so you need to, um, first of all, you need to think about the order of the questions. Um, it, you know, people can kind of figure out what you're getting at. So you have to think, okay, which questions can I ask first? Which questions can I ask last? You should never put the demographic questions, you know, like, how old are you? Uh, even where do you live? Um, what, your, what, what is your annual income? You should never put those first. They always go at the end, okay? Your first question should be something that's easy and that grabs people's attention. Like I always have a pretty picture or something like, oh yeah, okay, I know the answer to this or I want to answer this. And then you can have harder questions and then at the end you have the personal information as needed. Um, but that, you know, you have to think about that, that order. You have to think really hard about the survey's design um, how pretty it is it to look at. You have to use blank space to your advantage so that it's nice and organized, very clear, where am I supposed to go? If I'm skipping questions, you need arrows that go from one place to another. Um, you even have to think about how the survey is folded. If you're folding it in an envelope, it has to be easy to open and etc. So here, I'm gonna pass an example of a survey we've been uh, using in our lab this summer. Um, and I only have one cover sheet. I don't know what I did with the other cover sheet. I think TSA stole them, honestly. But, um, but, but, uh, but they all would have this cover sheet. Um, and then there's the survey, and we can just pass them around. And just uh, notice at the top, I have this nice title. 
Um, and it's a little bit about what this survey is about, but it's written very general so that anyone can feel like it applies to them. And then the first question, I actually don't even use the first question in my report. It's just to draw people in. It's got a picture, you pick something, and then you've got their attention. And then I start asking questions. And notice, you know, um, when I'm doing the Likert scale answers, I've got a very, lots of space and I've got color coding so that people don't um, mess up, you know, what, um, what row they're on. Um, and then the last page, um, the last page is that uh, demographic information, background information. And I tell them, you know, this section is for statistical purposes only. As a reminder, all survey responses will be strictly confidential. So I reassure them that, you know, I take their data um, um, uh, seriously and that I'm, I'm going to be careful with it. Um, the, the neat thing about this survey was each survey packet also contained a map of people's property. And so if you see E, map instructions, I asked people, well, we asked people, where would you plant these pollinator habitats on your property? So uh, the whole goal of the survey was to, so, so let me back up. Like, you all know that pollinators are in trouble, right? And that the, the decrease, you know, the land use land cover changes um, that reduce their forage and nesting availabilities are part of the issue with pollinators. And we also know that, you know, it's be an easy problem to solve if people just, both the general public and, and uh, government, you know, um, land stewards would just plant more. But what we don't know, especially in the U.S., is the willingness of people to plant more pollinator habitat on their private lands. Most of the land is in the U.S., is in the East Coast and Midwest, is in private land ownership. So if everybody planted pollinator habitat, well, you know, we do a, you know, we we it'd be a it'd be a <coughs> movement forward. It would provide those nesting and floral resources, and so we we designed this survey to figure that out. But it's really hard to ask people, would you plant one acre or two acres? So what we did is we added a map of their property, and we asked them to circle on the property places where they might put, um, you know. Uh, the echinacea or a wildflower prairie or milkweed and and then we can digitize those and for each property owner we have uh, an amount of area and a proportion of their parcel that they might be willing to um, to plant in pollinator habitat. And we can also look at all tons of landscape ecology metrics. Are these parcels more elongated? Are there big blobs? Um, what, you know, how large are these patches on average, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like you may wonder why a geospatial scientist is doing surveys. Well, I'm combining both of these, um, these approaches, methodologies to answer questions that haven't been answered before. Um, so, so anyways, but that's what the survey was about. And I'll just um, pass them around so you... Um, you can look at it and I mean mine isn't perfect by any means but it gives you I mean it gives you an idea of, of how we did that um, of, of what's needed um, and all of the formatting is done in uh, Google Slides okay so it's a Google slide that's been uh, set up as a page and then you just paste text boxes and tables where you paste your questions um, to make it look really, really nice and professional. And you can even hire people to do it, but I'm too cheap to do that. Um, so, 